Now, seeds of Libya's destruction were planted in 1981 by former U.S. President Ronald Reagan in a conspiracy that lasted 33 years. Libya's 2011 revolution was a godsend. It gave the U.S. the perfect opportunity to deliver the final blow. Today, Libya lies in ruin thanks largely to America's cowboy diplomacy. But let's take a look at what remains of Africa's once most prosperous and politically stable country. A country in disarray. After toppling former dictator Muammar Gaddafi, Libyans thought they would live in peace and prosperity. But foreign powers, such as the United States, had other plans. The U.S. always wanted to divide the region into small states to control its abundant petroleum reserves. Political thinker Bernard Louise wrote about these plans years ago. It is working in Iraq and Syria. Sudan is already divided. They failed in Egypt. But the turn is on Libya, and it's obvious. Analysts say leaked documents prove U.S. President Barack Obama aided the opposition, many of them extremist Islamists, with arms and money to control the country. Now they're threatening its very existence. With nearly 50 million pieces of weapons in the streets, the feuding militias are causing havoc and are seeking power. Analysts say the U.S. is not working alone. Fingers point to Qatar and Turkey as instigators of the American plan in the region. They have the financial means and political will to play that role. But how can Libya avoid the fate of Iraq and Syria? First, complete the democratic process with the current parliamentary elections and a new constitution that places the base for a strong state. Important to have a strong united army to counter terrorism and what Khalifa Haftar is doing is a good step towards this. Finally, choosing a head of state should be through direct elections and not by the parliament to ensure he's chosen by the nation and has the mandate to rebuild the country. Libya is a country with a vast wealth of petroleum and mineral resources. Several powers want to have a stake in this wealth. But it's up to the Libyans to keep their country intact. Yasser Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. So why did the United States find it necessary to destroy Libya? And just how did the U.S. carry out seemingly completely undeterred the destruction of Africa's once most prosperous and politically stable countries? Well, to shed some light on this conspiracy, we are joined from Tehran by Professor Mohamed Marandi, an Iranian academic and political analyst. Professor Marandi is an associate professor of English literature at the University of Tehran and a member of the Institute for North American and European Studies. Also joining me here in studio is Professor Peter Kagwanja. Uh, Professor Kagwanja is the chief executive at the Africa Policy here in Nairobi. Professor Kagwanja, welcome to the program. Thank you, Beatrice. Well, uh, Professor Marandi, I'm going to start off with you in Tehran. The genesis of the reckless U.S. policy on Libya dates back to the 1980s. So why did the U.S., though, find it necessary to completely destroy Libya in 2011? At that time, uh, the uh, awakening in this region, or as in the West they like to call it, the Arab Spring, was uh, moving forward rather rapidly. And uh, it seems like as that the United States and allies such as uh, Britain and France wanted to, alongside uh, countries like uh, Qatar and Turkey, and other oil-rich dictatorships in this part of the world, Arab dictatorships, they wanted to move the, um, these changes, the, the shifting balance of power in the region, in a direction that would be to their benefit. Uh, obviously, in Tunisia and Egypt, two dictatorships that were close to the United States were overthrown, and uh, the United States um, along with these countries thought that uh, in, through Syria and Libya they could uh, force uh, a change in, in, in government right. that would uh, restore the balance in the favor of the United States. And of course Libya has vast amounts of uh, very high quality oil, light oil, and uh, France and Britain especially wanted to take, uh, have control of that. All right. Uh, the America may have wanted to take control of Libya's oil, but uh, that policy 
on Libya, though, I mean, it goes back 42 years, uh, you know, wanting to destabilize uh, Libya. Why have subsequent, though, American presidents seen it fit to, you know, to, to propagate that policy well into the 21st century? During the Cold War, obviously, uh, the, the Libyan government was opposed to the United States. It was more closely affiliated to the Soviet camp, and that was a reason in itself for the United States to want to um, uh, overthrow the, uh, the, the, the government. Uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, of course, the United States did not end its um, quest for full hegemony, and therefore in Libya um, continue to be a problem for the United States. And we know that the United States, uh, in, by uh, claiming that the uh, downing of the Lockerbie, um, of the airliner over Lockerbie, was done by the Libyan government, uh, the United States was able to impose very harsh sanctions on the Libyan people, which actually killed a lot more people than were killed in. Uh, the airline crash, but it was in order to put pressure on the Libyan government so that they could ultimately take control of Libya. And of course, that has to do with Libya's very huge Correct. oil wealth, which is a very uh, excellent type of oil, and because it has a very small population, so whoever is in control of that wealth is really in a very commanding position. All right, uh, Pro uh, Professor Kagwanja, it is about the oil uh, in Libya, less about uh, the people of Libya here. Assess for us the policy, uh, the U.S. policy in Africa. It has tended to be quite problematic, though, hasn't it, mm. where it has gone in uh, for military incursions? Yeah, for many years, America's economic interest took a back seat in Africa, <coughs> and um, it was largely the geostrategic interest, particularly relating to the Cold War, uh, and therefore... Whereas the Cold War was cold elsewhere, in Africa it was extremely hot. And thanks to the American policy, um, it, this particular policy of intervening in African countries and destabilizing them would start in 1961 in the Congo. And it would reach a very dangerous uh, point after 1979 when Afghanistan uh, was invaded by the Russians. And the Americans took the policy of Vietnamization of the continent, meaning targeting countries that were under Marxist regimes uh, in, Lib in uh, 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 Angola, Mozambique, uh, Egy uh, Ethiopia, and so on. Why this tactic, though, in Africa? The idea was to destabilize the state, and uh, the logic at that time was to make these uh, uh, countries ineffectual, so weak that they cannot be able to sustain or to be the footholds of uh, communism at that time. Now, after, n after 2000, or the, in the new millennia, the, a new theory has come up, which is rarely pronounced in public. It is called destroy and rebuild. And destroy and rebuild theory literally means that uh, if you destroy a country, you rebuild it and bring on to the regime, or, uh, into the, among the people, or upon the people. But they haven't new, been able to rebuild Libya, though. Th th that's, wh that's where the problem is coming in. The destroy and rebuild theory, which would go to around 2000, 2003, and which would uh, be better uh, pronounced in Iraq, does not, uh, does not work because you destroy a country and the forces that you unleash are so complex and so difficult that even the superpower is unable to, to, to reign them. This was the case with the, uh, I mean, uh, Somalia. So Somalia actually was such a, a, a dangerous, um, or rather a, a back, uh, I mean, a, a, a setback for America. It is be now becoming the case in Libya where new uh, militants are uh, in control and America is unable to shape the destiny, and it's itself becoming a victim, in the sense, if you look at the assassination of its ambassador right. in September 11, 2012. All right. Uh, uh, Professor Marandi, I mean, Libya right now, as a result of the whatever has happened since 2011, is struggling, uh, you know, through a period of chaotic transition. Uh, many are suggesting that the United States, having gone into Libya, with NATO and done what they did, that they should be responsible, really, in cleaning up that mess. Do you agree? Well, the United States, if it wanted to clean up all the uh, uh, tragedies uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the big mess that they've created across this region, 
uh, they would never be able to com accomplish it. Uh, but uh, I don't think the Americans ever express remorse for the tragedies that they have created. Remember, Libya is a part of a larger puzzle. Uh, the United States wants control of the oil, not only for the sake of Libyan wealth, but also to contain potential ri rivals like China itself. Uh, if you know, if we all can see clearly that some of the countries that the United States has focused on in recent years, such as Venezuela, Libya, Sudan, where in the South was bro broke off from Sudan with the help of the United States, and of course pressure against Iran. These are all very uh, wealthy countries that have a great deal of natural resources, especially oil, and uh, many of them are uh, export or exported an enormous amount of oil to China. So the Americans want to have full control over uh, oil and gas resources so that it could put pressure on potential rivals. That's one issue. The second, the second the, one of the tragedies though, the second point that I wanted to make, is that the United States used allies in, in this part of the world, in the Persian Gulf region, oil-rich dictatorships, which advocate a very uh, extreme ideology called Wahhabism. Wahhabism and the Salafists that are being spread from um, Arab countries in the Persian Gulf, they have extreme ideologies. Nigeria, Boko Haram is linked to this ideology in, in Afghanistan, the Taliban. Yeah. So now the United States, because it, in, in, in Libya, they along with Qatar and others, uh, and allied themselves with these extremist groups. So now, unfortunately, in Libya, partially thanks to these groups, we have extremism. And this is something that we've seen across the region and beyond. So it's sort of like a cancer which is spreading because of this unholy alliance between the United States and its uh, oil-rich uh, dictatorship allies. Professor Kagwan, let me just get your view on mm. this. Does the United States, though, have a moral authority to clean up the mess it started in Libya? I think it does have a moral responsibility. It also has a moral responsibility to uh, kind of apologize to the international community because if we are talking about establishing uh, universal morals that are going to govern uh, uh, humanity uh, and the global order that we are now uh, embracing, it is only fair that uh, we, we pray by the rule. Um, the destruction of Libya itself, and the African uni uh, Union said as much, was not necessary. Uh, it might have been necessary to urge uh, um, the late Gaddafi to, uh, to leave power, but uh, Gaddafi himself was willing to leave power within a certain arrangement, and that arrangement was, was being ag agreed upon. The destruction that has been raised on that country, the country that uh, almost single-handedly bore the, 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 the whole um, responsibility of creating a new Africa, the, the so-called um, the African Union, uh, NEPAD, and all these edifices were actually um, you know, financed by, uh, by Libya uh, generously. And, and Libya did quite a lot. That is not to say that Gaddafi had not, uh, did not have his downsides, but the kind of a d destruction that was uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, had to down on the Libyan people or for the last uh, five or three years is, is not equivalent to what uh, the crime Gaddafi uh, may have committed in 40 years. When you look at it, though, as, as you mentioned that, uh, you know, the African Union's voice mm. uh, was ignored by the United States and its NATO allies there, uh, and, and now the African Union is being proven correct when it had pointed out that it might destabilize, mm -hmm. you know, the entire region. Uh, how is all this, though, being watched and received in Africa? I, I think it's what you call the hubris of superpower. The hope of superpower is that you have the power, therefore you can do with it what you want. Uh, the, the power that perhaps one would want is the gentle giant. You are, you are giant, but you are gentle and you are kinder to the rest of the world. America is, in a sense, in, in, particularly in the specific case of Libya, and many other countries in Africa that are facing this you know, push towards destruction in order to be rebuilt. Uh, in the model that, uh, you know, uh, as children used to have the modeling, you would create an elephant and destroy it, create a giraffe and destroy it. I mean, th that cannot happen in humanity. Uh, therefore, what America needs to do is to allow democracy to thrive in its own pace and also to allow, to accept that we are living in a multipolar world. 
where powers will emerge and powers will rise, others will fall. And as that happens, the only I mean, the horrid thing that we should observe is humanity. And therefore, uh, there must be a way in which we, we should be able, as a, co as a corrective, right. to hold these powers responsible morally right. for some of these destructions. Has America been irresponsible in its approach to countries in Africa? Well, the, the, if you look at the case of... Has it been irresponsible in its approach to Libya? It has in, the, in, in, in response to Libya. It has been largely to many African countries. This is not to say that the America has not done good things about the continent, but its military approach, it's, uh, the, the level at which it is operating, particularly in, uh, in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and now the northern part of Africa, uh, crossing to the Middle East, uh, it is beginning to, uh, to bring this image of a superpower fighting back to contain rising powers. And I don't think that is the way to go, uh, to contain rising powers. As it has been argued, and I, agree, I concur with that thesis, the scramble for Africa started in 2000. It is now uh, rising in earnest. Right. And this is taking the, the form of trying to control the resources. Why, why is it that it is those countries in Africa which have oil or which are discovering oil that are now target of destabilization? All right. Why is Nigeria in turmoil? Why is Kenya having the security problems that we are having? Why is South Sudan uh, improving, right? Why is Sudan itself in turmoil from Darfur to, uh, to wherever? And why are uh, ordinary, uh, why is Central Africa in, in a crisis? We'll put that to you, why? It is because they are oil producing countries. You can get this oil responsibly without having to destroy the countries. All right, uh, Professor Kagwanja will return to that discussion in a moment. Professor Mohamed Marandi also joining us uh, from Tehran. Do stay with us on the program. We'll return in just a moment. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now, after the United States and its allies reduced Libya to rubble with their bombs, what followed was chaos and a complete breakdown of law and order. Nearly three years later, Libya is still on its knees. The anarchy has spread into the Maghreb and the Sahel, where heavily armed insurgents roam. The big question is, can the United States be brought to account? Still with us on the program from Tehran is Professor Mohamed Marandi. In Cairo is Dr. Ziad Akul joining us from Cairo. And in studio with me is Professor Peter Kagwanja. Gentlemen, welcome back to the program. Uh, Dr. Ziad, you're joining us there uh, from Cairo. You've heard the perspectives from Tehran and uh, from Nairobi on the, the, U, the United States' uh, role in what is Libya's ruins today. Uh, just how much is the United States culpable in what has happened to Libya in your assessment? I, I'm very actually I'm very much against the idea of making the United States somehow responsible for, for, for all the fiasco that we're witnessing in the Middle East right now. Not only in Libya, but the whole process of what you could call the Arab Spring. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying that the United States did not have a hand in one way or the other in what we're witnessing in Libya right now, but we also have to treat Libya um, the way that it should be treated, which is basically a country that has been under a, an oppressive regime for 42 years that absolutely had no idea of how to build the state and that suddenly um, became in need of, of a political elite, became in need of a state and its institutions, became in need of somehow a procedural uh, process to run this country and, 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 and it, it, these are all elements that, that, that Libya simply did not possess. This is not the direct fault of the United States. It uh. is not somehow uh, the, the mistake of America that did not provide that. But simply, we, it, 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 it should have been um, 
it, it, it's, it's a lot more logical to think that when you are responsible for a huge process of military intervention like the one that the United States and the NATO uh, led in Libya, it is logically expected that afterwards you would be also responsible for a leading a political transformation process. But we, we, we are not seeing uh, much in terms of uh, the role of the United States and NATO in leading the political transition and the rebuilding of Libya. I mean, after they went in there and, you know, uh, did what they did. Why aren't we seeing them taking a front step, a front line, so to speak, in rebuilding Libya? Well, so simply, simply because Libya is, is a very... Um, special case really first of all you cannot you cannot expect libya to be treated as a state because as we rationally conceive of what a state is libya is not and second of all so many problems actually have been buried and have been hidden for all those for so many years that simply the united states and its uh, western allies simply wanted to protect their interests in libya without dealing with those problems so you cannot uh, go and um, import some um, right. political elite. So, for example, what happened right after the, the, the fall of Gaddafi was simply thinking that the Libyan uh, people, that the Libyan diaspora, those who live uh, outside, those who lived in Europe for the 40 years that Gaddafi had ruled in, are capable of, of running Libya. And that's basically what happened, All right. trying to reach out to those who were Professor Kagwanja, your sentiments on that, do you agree? Well, I wouldn't agree in the sense that um, there, there were better avenues uh, uh, in which Gaddafi could have been gotten rid of from power. And most of us wrote around those times and indicated the steps that needed to be done from an African perspective because we are in the continent and we are watching, uh, we are the people who are bearing the brunt of dictatorships anyway. Uh, so we, we know better how to, to get them out without necessarily hurting our populations. Now, now what happened in Libya is that you caught the support of extremists, the militants, the Al-Qaeda's and others, to destroy a regime. Then the, the, the same come and establish their own Sharia, and you now want to come back and destroy the same Sharia through different, through um, in, um, informal means. And finally, the whole country is led through Zonanake. And, uh, and that is what we have in Libya today, that uh, we have so many forces and they cannot even allow the government, the institutions of government to, uh, to, to, to grow. Uh, look at the Libyans. The Libyans heading the governments of Libya are people who are capable. They know how to establish institutions. The Libyans, uh, I have met very many Libyan activists. Right. They, know, they know so much. But why can't they do it? Because the means by which the regime was destroyed which is quoting the power of the extremists to destroy the government, is that the, this is the, the gene that you cannot put back into the bottle. All right. Unfortunately, we're going to wind up in a moment, but I want to get your closing uh, sentiments. Professor Marandi, first uh, from uh, Tehran. Uh, how do you propose, though, that the international community responds, particularly the United States uh, and its Western allies? How, how do you propose that they respond to the situation in Libya as it is today? Well, I think the United States should simply, and the Europeans should m stay out of other countries' affairs, and that would do a lot, a lot of good in itself. The United States has always advocated uh, dictatorship. Its closest allies right now in this part of the world are dictatorships that have no constitution. The reason why, I think your previous guest made a very good point, the reason why the United States and Europeans can control Libya is because they destroyed it with the help of extremists that were exported by some of these uh, allies of theirs. And uh, so they've destroyed the country and they can't reap the benefits for themselves either. All right, uh, Dr. Ziad Aku. I think that uh, the, ro the more efficient, the more effective solution right now would not be an international in, uh, intervention as much as it uh, would be a regional one. I think that Libya right now is actually in need of um, more of regional support. It, 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 Libya is required actually to um, be a lot more in, in, in touch with its uh, regional neighbors, whether in, uh, in Africa or in the Middle East or in the Arab world. 
And while actually could, there could be a process of empowerment, of political empowerment done by uh, the United States and, 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 and the Europeans, but there must be a political process, a clear political process that um, could be implemented by the help of, of the um, uh, international allies and, and the US, while there should be a, again, a military empowerment process that one way or the other should be also managed by the regional, part of the regional uh, neighbors of, of, of Libya. So basically, there is like a two-way, two, there are two paths that, that must be followed right now. One of them is that of creating a political process, supporting it, empowering it, and actually trying to implement it with uh, creating or, or looking for the um, sufficient, political, uh, sufficient political elite inside of Libya. And on the other hand, another path was trying basically to ensure that there's a state that has a monopoly over violence. Uh -huh. And in this, in this regard, Libya could very much use its, 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 its neighbor allies, uh, it, 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 its neighboring, um, it, the neighboring countries, uh, countries like Egypt and, and um, Tunisia. And basically, uh, um, there, there, there should be a a lot of focus on trying to reestablish a military force or, or in a, Libya that should go hand in hand with, um, uh, with establishing a, uh, and also a political process um, supported by the international community. Professor Kagwanja, after the U.S. and NATO pointedly ignored the African Union's efforts on Libya in 2011, how do you propose uh, you know, I, I they should intervene now? I think we need to revisit the African Union roadmap for the uh, rebuilding or for the building of democracy in Libya, which would, me which would mean uh, that we, the, we, we, we strengthen the political process, uh, we strengthen the economic process, the civil society in Libya, but at the same time, we, the international community, particularly America and uh, the European Union uh, who intervened, need to find a solution to the militants because they brought them. So with their allies from the Middle East, they should get the Sarafist out of Libya or to, to de-radicalize the Libyan society. Because as I argued earlier, the problem now is not about the inability of the Libyans to build their own democracy. It's about the problem that was injected into the society. That is extremism. And that was given around to reign supreme in the country. Reigning that extremism is the greatest challenge to Libya, and the Libya will have to be helped on that one. But uh, going back to 2011, taking the African Union roadmap, the building, the, the transformation of Libya, both economically, politically, and economically, might be the way to go. Uh, but the radicalization is, should be primary in that agenda. All right. Uh, Professor Peter Kagwanja, Chief Executive at the Africa Policy, joining us here in studio from Tehran. Uh, Professor Mohamed Marandi, an Iranian academic and political analyst. Uh, Professor Marandi is also an Associate Professor of English Literature at the University of Tehran and a member of the Institute for North American and European Studies. In Cairo, Dr. Ziad Akul, Senior Researcher at the al Ahram Center, for political and strategic studies. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today on Talk Africa. I'm Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. Goodbye for now. We follow the latest trends in global politics, economics, culture, and sport, and how Africa fits into the global picture. You decide what's important. We need some trade and justice. Africa's future will be determined by Africa. For women's equal opportunity, for a better life. We have to change something, and it's not the, the, the outsiders. Talk Africa, a new voice for the world.